Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the first city council meeting of 2022. This is for Tuesday, January 11th. This city council meeting is being held telephonically and virtually in compliance with state executive and legislative actions responding to the COVID-19 emergency. And with that, I'm gonna call this meeting to order. And our first order of business is to get the oath of office to our newly elected council members. And I will start with Mr. Samomo. And Joe, if you could repeat after me, I'm gonna read the oath of office. I, Joseph Samomo Jr. I, Joseph Samomo Jr. Having been duly elected, having been duly elected to the office of to the office of Covington City Council Covington City Council position number 4 position number 4 do solemnly swear do solemnly swear that I will faithfully that I will faithfully and impartially discharge and impartially discharge the duties of this office the duties of this office as prescribed by law as prescribed by law and to the best of my ability and to the best of my ability and that I will support and that I will support and maintain and maintain the constitutions the constitutions of the state of Washington of the state of Washington and of the United States of America and of the United States of America Congratulations, Joe, on your re-election to position number four. It is an honor to sit on the dais with you, well, virtually, and um, <laughs> to work with you in uh, everything in the community and regionally. So thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you very much. And next we will read the oath of office for Jennifer. I can find the right one. All right, Jennifer. Congratulations on your reelection. Thank you. And if you could raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Jennifer Harjahausen. I, Jennifer Harjahausen. Having been duly elected. Having been duly elected. To the office of. To the office of. Covington City Council. Covington City Council. Position number two. Position number two. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully that I will faithfully and impartially discharge and impartially discharge the duties of this office, the duties of this office as prescribed by law, as prescribed by law and to the best of my ability and to the best of my ability and that I will support and that I will support and maintain and maintain the constitutions, the constitutions of the state of Washington, of the state of Washington and of the United States of America. And of the United States of America. Congratulations, Jennifer. Thank um, it's you. an honor to work with you on the dais as well. And thank you for all that you do in the community also. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And next is Beth. And Beth, congratulations on your reelection as well. And if you could repeat after me, raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Elizabeth Porter. I, Elizabeth Porter. Having been duly elected. Having been duly elected. To the office of. To the office of. Covington City Council. Covington City Council. Position number six. Position number six. And do solemnly swear. And do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully. That I will faithfully. And impartially discharge. And impartially discharge. The duties of this office the duties of this office as prescribed by law as prescribed by law and to the best of my ability and to the best of my ability and that I will support and that I will support and maintain and maintain the constitutions the constitutions of the state of Washington of the state of Washington and of the United States of America and of the United States of America congratulations Beth and um like it's an honor to sit with you on the dais as well. And I really appreciate all that you do for the community and the region as well. So thank you. Thank you. The honor is all mine. All right. With that, 
Um, let's do, now that we're all official, Krista, if you could please call the roll. Yes, Council Member Kokel. Present. Council Member Soltis. I am here. Council Member Harjahausen. Present. Council Member Samomo. I'm here. Council Member Porter. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Smith. Mayor Wagner. I'm here. We have a quorum, Your Honor. Thank you, Krista. If everybody could please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all for that. And next up on our agenda is selection of mayor and mayor pro tem. And so we'd like to start with the selection of mayor. Sean? Mr. Mayor, yes, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to nominate Jeff Wagner uh, for mayor. I would second that. It's been um, nominated. Uh, Jeff Wagner has been nominated and seconded to be become mayor for the next two years. Sean, would you like to speak to your motion? Uh, certainly. So um, I, I don't think uh, Jeff needs a lot of uh, uh, introduction and and um, um, I, I don't even know what the right word is. Uh, Jeff is, is doing an outstanding job as mayor, and I'm more than happy to nominate him again. I really appreciate the way he represents the city. Um, the his ability to uh, interact and kind of what Laura said today, connect the city to not only its residents and constituents, but also to the greater uh, community as well. So um, uh, I think he's doing a great job and, and look forward to two more years. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Christina, would you like to speak to your second? Sure. Um, I've known Jeff for a, a little over two years. And um, watching him govern, I think there have been many situations that have been not only controlled, but de-escalated um, in the prompt response um, of Jeff. It is an honor to sit side by side and to lead Covington. Jeff is always available, um, not only to the city council, but I, from my observation to the residents of the city, um, somehow somehow like you you say the energizer bunny somehow he makes time for everything and everybody and i commend you and um there is no greater person that would fill those shoes than you thank you thank you christina is there anybody else wishing to speak for or against the motion all right thank you um sean and christina and everybody i will call for a roll call vote um is for appointing Jeff Wagner as mayor for the next two years to represent the city of Covington. Uh, Jared, how do you vote? Aye. Sean, how do you vote? Aye. Christina, how do you vote? Aye. Jennifer, how do you vote? Aye. Joe, how do you vote? Aye. Beth, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you. Um, I vote aye as well. So it's an, going to, it's unanimous that um, I will represent each of you and the City of Covington, not just in the city, but regionally. Um, and I really appreciate it. It's an honor to represent each of you. And I don't take these duties lightly. Um, I just hope that we can continue to bring Covington to the forefront everywhere we go. So thank you. Uh, next up is selection of Mayor Pro Tem. I move to appoint Sean Smith as Mayor Pro Tem. Second. It's been Third. moved. And moved by Jennifer and seconded by Beth to appoint Sean Smith as our mayor pro tem for the next two years. Jennifer, would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, please. Um, Sean is thoughtful, deliberate. He listens. He actually is curious why um, things are the way they are or why a person thinks the way that they think, um, whether he agrees with them or not. Um, 
he is always even tempered. He looks ahead at the future. He understands the big picture and the integration of all the moving parts locally and regionally. Um, I think we're really fortunate to have such um, a great leadership team on our council and I'm excited to nominate Sean to be your partner mayor. Thank you, Jennifer. Beth, would you like to speak to your second? Uh, you know, just to echo what Jennifer uh, had said, particularly, you know, the even temperedness, the curiosity, the, the willingness to listen, and the connections within the community um, on many different levels, um, not just in the city, but um, in the region. Uh, I think it, it's quite the asset. And I know that he has stepped in in Jeff's and the very few times Jeff has been absent and has done a wonderful job running the meetings as well. So um, it's definitely an asset to the community. I'd be proud to have him as our pro tem. Thank you, Beth. Joe, would you like to speak to your third? Uh, I'm actually very, very upset with you, Jennifer, because uh, I want to say traditionally I have nominated Sean and I was very much looking forward to doing it again. So, but no, <laughs> Sean, everything that's been said about Sean uh is true he is thoughtful considerate uh and he's just a wonderful human being let's let's go with that sean's just a wonderful human being and i uh, have no qualms about his leadership on our council and i have no uh, no issues if he needs to step in for uh, for jeff at any time because i believe he can do the job thank you joe is there anybody else wishing to speak for or against the motion I just want to say that, um, Sean, it is an honor to uh, work with you and partner with you to lead this city. And I know that anytime any question or anything comes up, you really do the research and come up with some very out thinking outside the box on all the topics that come up. So it's a, it's a true honor to work with you. So with that, we will call for a roll call vote um, to appoint uh, Sean Smith as our mayor pro tem for the next two years. Jared, how do you vote? Aye. Sean, how do you vote? Aye. Christina, how do you vote? Aye. Jennifer, how do you vote? Aye. Joe, how do you vote? Aye. Beth, how do you vote? Aye. I vote aye. It is unanimous to uh, appoint Sean Smith as our mayor pro tem. And Sean, would you like to say anything? Um, I, I really appreciate appreciate all the, the kind words and a little bit um, choked up right now. It, it, it means a lot to um, hear the, um, the praise from your, your people that you respect so much. Um, so uh, hopefully I can continue to live up to that and, and um, do the city proud. So thank you very much. It, it really does mean a lot. Thank you, Sean, and congratulations. And with that, we'll move into approval of agenda. Regan, do we have any changes? Sorry, no changes, Mayor. Thank you. I look for a motion to approve the agenda. So, so moved. moved. Second. Been moved by Joe and seconded by Christina to approve the agenda as printed and posted. Call for a roll call vote. Jared, how do you vote? Aye. Sean, how do you vote? Aye. Christina, how do you vote? Aye. Jennifer, how do you vote? Aye. Joe, how do you vote? Aye. Beth, how do you vote? Aye. I vote aye. It is unanimous to approve the agenda. Then our first public communication for 2022. Welcome Dana Newts, the executive director of the Covington Chamber of Commerce, giving us a 2021 chamber wrap up and highlights. Welcome Dana. It's great to see you tonight. Good evening, thank you. It's good to see you too. I wanna to start by, uh, first of all, thanking you for the opportunity to share what the Covington Chamber's been up to. But more importantly, I wanna congratulate you, Mayor Wagner, Mayor Pro Tem Smith, and our returning council members. Uh, we've always uh, valued our relationship with the city of Covington, and we look forward to continuing that in the years to come. And with that, I have a brief PowerPoint presentation. I'd like to share with you some of the highlights from the chamber for the last year. Um, I need to back up just a second. Excuse me. 
Okay. So today, uh, rather than doing kind of our standard 2021 uh, State of the Chamber address, I thought it would be more interesting perhaps to see the photos of the year behind us and to look at all the things that we achieved. But I wanna make it clear that none of this happened in a vacuum and there's no one single person that's responsible for all the things that the, the Covington Chamber achieved in the last year. It was led by a very dedicated board of directors and we had some amazing ambassadors who serve as wonderful advocates for the city or for the city and for uh, the Covington Chamber and our, and our member businesses. It was a year of transition. We had uh, new board members, Mark Smith from Multicare, Elaine Cruzat from Eat the Frog Fitness and George Frazier of George River or Green River Found College Foundation joined the board. Brad Belcher from Bicycle Rescue Youth joined as an ambassador, and I joined the Covington Chamber team in February as executive director, and well, you know, COVID. So in 2021, we had 17 new members and two returning members for a total membership of 153 at the end of the year. One of the accomplishments from last year that we are very proud is the Veteran Spouse Scholarship from Green River College Foundation. This was started in 2019, but last year was the first year that we were actually able to award the scholarship. And the wife of a veteran received uh, funding for uh, to study nursing at Green River College. There is enough money left for another scholarship and the board will work toward finding a sustainable funding mechanism so we can continue to provide this scholarship in the future. Something that's very important to us is to support veterans and uh, their spouses. The Good Work Fund. This is, this is one of the many things that makes the Covington Chamber unique. This was started by the board and uh, Jennifer Liggett in 2020 as a way for our member sponsors to contribute to the community in a new way. So they started the Good Work Fund. Uh, all the members that you see listed here are member sponsors and a portion of their Covington Chamber membership investment goes toward the Good Work Fund. In 2021, we had $6,000 in funds that we could use to do good work throughout the community. So it could be used as an economic driver to support a nonprofit um, project or to uh, support with um, COVID supplies, PPE kits, uh, what have you. you. See a couple of pictures here. One of them is Bicycle Rescue for Youth. We were able to provide um, helmets for uh, some of the kids that receive bikes through the, the nonprofit. We also were able to donate or to purchase gift cards, uh, grocery and gift gas gift cards for Vine Maple Place for them to use as their clients. So the grocery cards were just to kind of help stretch their grocery budget um, through the week and the gas cards were to help them go to uh, for, for job interviews. Uh, this year we have 16 member sponsors. So we'll raise about $5,800. So, and we've got $3,000 left from last year. So we've got some seed money if we have a larger project. And I'm hoping that some of these member sponsors will help us choose the projects and organizations that we support in 2022. We all know that COVID has been tough for everyone. And last year, we just wanted to bring a little sunshine to people. So partnering with the city of Covington and Red Canoe Credit Union, we uh, celebrated Small Business Week. We visited about two dozen businesses, brought them goodie bags and treats to say, thank you for choosing Covington for your business. Our visits were well received and it was a lot of fun for us. It was nice to be able to go out and do something positive in the community. And you can see that Karma jumped in and, and helped us deliver the great stuff. Something else that was really exciting last year was the Clean, the clean Safe Welcome City Committee. That's a mouthful. This was launched in October by Justin Van Lenshoot. He was someone who uh, formerly served on our board, but was really interested in doing something um, you know, action oriented. He's a very energetic guy, had all these great ideas, and he really wanted to make Covington a cleaner, safer, safer more welcome, community for residents and shoppers and businesses alike. One of the things that, that he accomplished is to adopt the street 164th Avenue between the Covington Library and Matson Middle School. We already had one cleanup event and uh, he is working on other projects and initiatives. Uh, you'll hear more about that uh, next year. This is something, a committee, you don't have to be a chamber member to contribute. It's open to residents, businesses, 
Um, anybody that wants to help can volunteer for a cleanup project. He's also working on uh, SEPTEB training, so um, helping businesses use environmental design to make their businesses uh, less attractive to uh, criminal elements and more attractive to shoppers and employees. So look for more uh, on the Clean, Safe, Welcome City Committee this year. PPE kits. Uh, one Eastside Spark received a donation of an, a lot of PPE items from Amazon earlier this year. So this fall, three of our ambassadors, Tamara Paul, Paul Warrick, and Amy Brock delivered PPE kits to member and non-member businesses this fall. We chose businesses that were most impacted by the vaccine verification requirements and who have the most need for PPE kits. So childcare centers, grocery stores, um, restaurants, gyms, um, any any place that goes through a lot of PPE kits. So this was this was a great opportunity for us to support the community. Um, ribbon cuttings. Ribbon cuttings are one of the things that we'd love to do the most. It's a free service for members, but COVID really kind of put a crimp on this. We weren't able to do very many. In 2020, um, Eat the Frog opened in Covington, and we had promised them a ribbon cutting ceremony, but we opted not to do it because of COVID. Well, this fall, we were finally able to get out there and to help them celebrate uh, their grand opening with a ribbon cutting. We also celebrated with Ristretto's uh, under new ownership. They held a grand reopening event in October or November, and we were very happy to be on hand. Uh, we also had three new businesses, Nana Southern Kitchen, Vineyard Park of Covington, and The Door Organics. We've got a handful of businesses that are ready to do ribbon cuttings in early 2022. So I'll make sure that uh, you get those dates. Our businesses love to see our city officials and they really appreciate the support from the community. So stay tuned for details. Ready, set, play. This is one of our most popular programs among residents. Uh, parents and kids alike enjoy this program. Last year, we had 22, 24 businesses participate, including 22 stops, uh, featuring two new businesses this year, um, and then two prize sponsors. Uh, the picture you see here, of course, is Mayor Wagner and his daughters. They came out to one of the lanyard, uh, the, the lanyard pass out events at Covington Community Park. I think Christina was there as well. So it was a lot of fun. We're looking forward to it this year and uh, we'll, We've already got this on our calendar, but we are hosting a health and wellness fair in June, and that will be the kickoff for Ready, Set, Play this year. So watch for more details on that. So other highlights, I don't wanna go into all of these in detail, but we received almost $19,000 in, in a state debt disaster relief fund that was facilitated by AWB. It was basically, there was no restriction on that grant money. It was basically replacement income because in 2020 and 2021, there were so many events we weren't able to host. We lost some members. So our revenue was significantly down. So the state helped us you know, keep operations going. We awarded $10,000 to three scholarship winners and a scholarship that was facilitated by Kent Community Foundation. Education is really important to the Covington Chamber and it is the cornerstone of workforce development. So we really believe in scholarships and we're looking forward to continuing to give scholarship this year. We also launched an online job service, it's something that was super easy to do on our website and it's a free service to members. With there being such a labor shortage, we thought it was a very easy way that we could support our businesses in finding uh, employees. We also helped organize and promote a COVID town hall in partnership with MultiCare and UW Valley in October. So that turned out to be a great event. Um, we got good participation the day of the event and the video is out on YouTube and it's continuing to get hundreds of, of, of views. So um, that, was a, that was a good event. And we also hosted our 2022 board retreat, which is where the, the uh, photo is from. And we're very excited to talk about next year. So I'll just give you a, a hint at a few highlights. Of course, one of, the one of the most important things that we do for our members is advocacy. And next week is the AWB Hill Climb. One of the things we'll be talking about is the Highway 18 project. It is this one particular stretch of road is one of the deadliest stretches of highway, not only in our state, but in our nation. So when we meet with our legislators next week, we are going to encourage them to adopt a transportation package that fully funds that. 
Covington Makers Market. This is a new community event. We will, we hope to host it twice, but we're gonna start uh, with the first one in April to see how it goes. Think of it like a farmer's market, but it'll be specifically for um, artists, musicians, artisan, craft pe craftspeople, and vendors that sell locally made goods. It will be at Real Life Church on the fourth Saturday of the month, and we hope it grows. If it does, we will combine it with Fall Fest uh, the first Saturday in October. So watch for those community events. We'd love for you to come out and tell all your friends and family about them. As I mentioned earlier, the Health and Wellness Fair sponsored by MultiCare will also be a new event. Healthcare is top of mind for all of us right now. We have so many great healthcare providers um, from a, a, a range of modalities throughout Covington. So we think this will be a great event and we want to kick off Ready, Set, Play because that's a great opportunity to get kids and parents in front of healthcare providers for educational purposes. And of course, we'll continue to support our businesses throughout COVID. And I can't stress enough the value that we place on our relationship with the city. You are integral to our success, and we so appreciate everything that you do to support us. So thank you. Well, Dana, thank you for um, coming tonight and sharing with us 2021 of the Covington Chamber and what we can look forward to in the future. Um, it's always a pleasure to partner with the Chamber. Um, I am sorry that I'm no longer on the board as I got kicked off, but that's fine. No, I, my term expired. So um, it was a fun time. Does council have any questions for Dana? Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you tonight. And at the very latest, I will see you in April to Sounds give my quarterly update. Dana, thank you again very much for coming and uh, you have a wonderful evening. Thank you, you too. Next on our public communication is Dave McFadden with the Port of Seattle Trusted Community Partner Network for Small Businesses. Welcome, David. Thank you, uh, Mayor Wagner and uh, members of the City Council. Glad to be here. Um, I think I'm joined with my partner, Vaughn Taylor, with the Seattle Metro Chamber, and we just wanted to orient the Council to a uh, small business outreach and technical assistance initiative that we're trying to build across the region. And um, just need a little coaching. I, I take it I'm gonna share my screen and um, talk from there, correct? Yes, you should be able to share your screen. I, great, I thought so, thank you. So, um, just. I wanted to talk to you and Vaughn and I wanted to talk to you about a trusted community partnership network. And uh, let me see if I can get this slide going. Go with me. Okay. Uh, I've been working for the last few months trying to put a regional technical assistance and outreach network together to support small businesses across Canada. Um, I think, as you know, this pandemic has really precipitated a small business recession in particular. As we trace across King County, we know, you know, our restaurants, our hospitality industry have been impacted. We've seen drops in employment. We also know that a lot of our BIPOC businesses have been disproportionately impacted um, by the economic challenges. And so in response to that, we have been working to develop a navigator network, if you will, of uh, hiring a number of navigators that would help conduct outreach to businesses across King County and really connect them to the variety of resources that are available. And it comes at a time when, as you know, a lot of the recovery resources are flowing in. We do have a lot of, I think, um, more resources to offer businesses, but we have to make sure that we are connecting them to the things they need to be successful going forward. And so that's really um, the whole concept behind building this network. And the real plan is to um, contract and provide a range of navigators across King County to help small businesses 
and get the critical help and resources they need to survive. It'll amp up, um, amp up the amount of outreach that we can provide and the technical assistance we can provide across the uh, county. Again, when the resources are flowing to our local community. We got this model really from a lot of cities that were doing this outreach, trying to help their small businesses connect to PPP loans and other resources earlier in the pandemic. What we're trying to do is just scale some of those successful local efforts and um, do this across the county. So what we think is it will help um, prevent some duplication of efforts and leverage the capacity of our current um, small business advisors and uh, helpers. The model that we've been working on would be um, shared. It would be a partnership between the port, the Seattle Metro Chamber, and the cities. And what we proposed is a, a per capita formula where we would have the cities join the partnership. It's an invitation. Um, and we would um, have the cities join the network we, as you can see, it's based on population um, and the funding would be capped for even the largest cities at $50,000 per year. We've mentioned and talked to many cities at this point um, and responded to the question. And yes, uh, you could use federal ARPA funding. We have a port grant fund that we've partnered with you on. You could use some of those resources to support this um, extra resource um, or your general fund. And so we want to be flexible and provide you a variety of means to look at this and, and join if it makes sense. What we think if we put it all together is that we would have a resource across King County of approximately a million dollars. And again, that would use, um, support probably a robust network of about 15 different navigators. They would both be able to span the different languages and be embedded in our uh, communities to help there. But a real crucial point is that uh, we also think there is a need out in the eastern portion of King County, and that not just ethnic um, competent navigators are needed, but maybe some circuit riders are needed further in East King County. And we've had some conversations with Maple Valley and North Bend and Carnation, and have gotten that feedback. Yes, that would be of value, we need to kind of test and assess. And so I'm, I'm um, sharing that, yes, through that outreach, we think it makes sense, not just to have culturally um, competent navigators, but also to um, consider geographic needs as well. And so um, as we go to our next slide, we started this really in the fall. And we sent out an invitation to um, join the network, um, help us build this trusted community partner network. And at this point, we've checked in with 20 plus cities. We've gotten some great questions. We've gotten a lot of support and we wanna keep going. And uh, so I will be setting up calls with the cities going forward next month to do a check-in. And I'd love to have you participate in those conversations. And then as you can see, we're gonna do some more robust community engagement over the next three months to further inform how and where these resources are applied. In May, we'll surface, we'll um, see who's ready to join in y'all launch. And what I also can say right now is that I've gotten enough support from my four commissioners to at least launch this on a pilot basis and support the early growth of it in especially the first year. And so I wanted to share that with you. I wanted to, um, I guess, talk about the concept and what we're trying to do, um, invite you to join, um, including the next steps with this engagement to the specifics of how it's going to work and certainly uh, invite you to ask any questions or provide some early input at this point in time. So. Um, with that, I guess I come back to the why. I think it does provide a network of community-based organizations and culturally knowledgeable advisors at a time um, that are helping businesses um, that probably need help. And it will augment 
the network of small business development centers, chambers, and other organizations that provide resources to small business. I think this, I just saw your chamber presentation and it's great. And I think this can be a further boost to the things you're trying to do in COVID. I think naturally by sharing some of the cost of promoting this and doing the outreach, there are some economies of scale. And it allows your city to really tap into a broader array of outreach and technical assistance resources that are available at this point in time. So that is really what I wanted to share with you tonight and just uh, certainly answer any questions you might have. Council, I have any questions for Dave? Jennifer. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, I was curious, um, how would a smaller city like Covington be guaranteed that our small businesses were getting the access um, to the services um, that larger cities would, would, you know, obviously have a little more attention, more businesses, maybe a little more vocal, more people at the table. Um, you know, I totally get the point of this. I think it's a great idea, but my 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 primary concern as an individual would be, would we get what we're paying for? It's a, thank you, great question. Um, I've gotten it before at, uh, from other council members in other cities, and I think it's the question of the day. And I can't answer fundamentally. I can say, let's build a partnership. And the best way you'll get the return on investment is to make sure the navigators are deployed in your community. So invite them in, get them networked with their chamber, point them in the direction of businesses that may need an outreach call. Um, the folks, it, uh, it's like school. The more you apply yourself and you get the A, the more you'll get out of the class. And I, I, I think, um, you do have the infrastructure there to make it success. Through our engagement going forward, what I really hope to do is map out what, how does this actually work in, in Covington, in Maple Valley, in North Bend. And um, this, is not a, this is not a center city initiative. What I explained earlier is that if we hire navigators, there will be some resources that are embedded out in these towns. And, that's really what I would like to um, investigate further over the next three months of how that works. Um, we need a circuit rider that goes, you know, just between Covington, Maple Valley, Black Diamond, and there's another one that serves North Bend, you know, up into Carnation and Duval. That's the engagement that further need. But the fundamental answer to the question is, um, we're looking for a partnership. And I think the return on investment for the city is how we deepen that partnership to make sure that navigator is calling on businesses that uh, would benefit from the resources available and making sure your businesses are connected to some of this uh, extra help and outreach that's available. And you mentioned the, the chamber, I, I see, or maybe it's, you know, anecdotally, I noticed that a lot of maybe the, the BIPOC businesses aren't necessarily a member of the chamber. So, you know, I would be curious to see what the proposed solutions are to reaching out to those businesses so they would have access, not just in Covington, but I'm sure, you know, that's a, a trend you see elsewhere. So the chamber couldn't, or maybe wouldn't necessarily be the primary focal point for these um, navigators, correct? Um, they would just be one source of um, entree. Okay. And we will have a website, we will likely have a call center that has language capacities so that, you know, uh, if, if a Spanish language speaking business in your community needs some extra help, that they will be able to tap that whether that navigator is available in your community every day of the week. And so, I'm, I, as I said that, um, I guess what we're ultimately trying to do is just provide that flexibility to respond to a multitude of given um, needs in Covington. Okay. 
Thank you. Anybody else have any questions for Dave? Beth. Uh, yeah, thank you. Hi, hi, David. Um, I, I guess I just wanted to reiterate like there is a chance there is a, a plan to have a plan in place so that we can see exactly what we'll be getting for our dollar not not to be city centric but we do need to watch out for our folks because we're the best advocates for businesses in, in the city of Covington and that is part of this process and then we're talking about twenty thousand dollars for the next two years and what is the plan moving forward after that and this might be too premature to ask that question but I think is it meant to be a, a one one shot thing to start building networks and getting these BIPOC communities the support they need so they can start learning how to navigate that at some point or or and rural, rural businesses as well so two questions is there a plan before we decide and what's the longevity and long term vision definitely definitely a plan Great question. Uh, I talked about the schedule earlier and over the next three months, that's where the plan and the specifics will develop. And that's where you will be able to see that and see whether it's worthwhile to join and what that means. And um, in the long term, that's, the, that's, a, that's another great question. I, we've been so preoccupied with just organizing and getting this up to scale at a time where there's a tremendous need um, our thoughts go to if we can scale this and we can show that it moves the needle and then we can teach some businesses how to fish. It, yeah, there, there's either a way to sustain this based on ROI that we all feel or there's a reduced burden because we have helped businesses either get the wind back in their sails or learn how to uh, tap these resources on their own. So a little fluidity going forward. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Well, Dave and Vaughn, thank you both very much for uh, coming tonight and great presentation. And we look forward to uh, partnering with you and moving forward. Thank you for having us and uh, I guess congratulations on all your re-elections and best wishes for 2022. Thank you. Thank you everyone. You bet, you both have a great evening. Thank you again. Next is a school safety update. We have Heidi Maurer with Kent Lake Principal and Samantha Katover with the Kentwood. Welcome. And I will turn it over to both you ladies. I don't know who's going first. Hello, good evening. Now that I got my technical issues under control, good evening, I'm Heidi Maurer, principal at Kent Lake. Samantha Ketover, principal of Kent Wood. Welcome. I believe that we're gonna share a, a PowerPoint with you. Um, if I can do that, here we go. We are not, I'm not a fluent Zoom user. I am uh, definitely a Teams person. So thanks for your patience. So Samantha and I are here tonight to share with you a little bit about what your Covington schools are doing in regards to school safety. And what does that look like? What's the training? Um, you know, how do we prepare to respond to emergencies? Sam. So the first thing that we wanted to make sure that everyone understood is that we really do approach this um, from a perspective that preparation and preparedness is empowering for staff and students. And why do we need to think this way? So here's some things from uh, the, uh, the FBI in terms of their research in regards to specifically to school shooting is that on average, each shooter displays four to five concerning behaviors over time. Things happen that if we pay attention to it and we see it, we can prevent emergency situations in our schools. The problem is, is if you look at the same data, um, about 83% of people who notice these things, the person they go to is, is the school shooter or the active shooter themselves. 
or they do nothing. And so if we don't tell someone, then we then these four to five things that people see that could help prevent school shootings, we're not no one's able to take action. So this is a, a common saying that we use and is used outside of schools as well. We really do encourage uh, staff, students, the community, uh, wholesale. If you see something, definitely please say something uh, so that we can respond. So tonight, what we hope to do in about 10 minutes is talk a lot about the proactive work that we do in our schools to prevent emergency situations. Talk about how we prepare students and staff. Talk about how we should have parents respond in our in, our, in emergency situations, as well as how can what role can our community play in responding in emergency situations. So as we go through the presentation, there will be several slides that talk about uh, the roles, responsibilities, et cetera, of different uh, portions of our, our school community in terms of proactive things that we do and also reactive things that we do. So for example, as uh, members of school administration, uh, Heidi and I are proactively working with our communities to, for example, develop a positive school culture, identify concerns, build safety plans, um, even do home visits and outreach. Um, whereas on the more reactive side, in an actual emergency. And this is not limited to um, active shooting or intruder situations. Um, in any emergency, Heidi and I are also um, managing the emergency responses, um, following the protocols, uh, communicating and collaborating with all the other first responders. And of course, um, helping to have the parents and community understand what has happened as well as um, help our staff and students to navigate the situation. One of the most one of the important partnerships that we have when we respond in an emergency situation are, are our school resource officers. Um, this is a great picture of Deputy Jana Wilson with the King County Sheriff's Office. Um, and she's one of many Kent school district safety officers who proactively spend 99% of their time working with students with mentoring, doing home visits, providing law enforcement on campus when it's needed, uh, provides legal education in classrooms. Uh, our SRO is always in classrooms, answering questions in AP government and uh, supporting our consent training and things like that. The goal is to have students have positive interactions with our law enforcement, um, the relationships that our deputies build with our students are key to preventing situations. I have gotten phone calls from the Covington Police Department in the evening saying, help me get a hold of Deputy Wilson. This kid is sitting here saying, I only talk to my sheriff. Where's my sheriff? I mean, they build these amazing relationships. There are times, though, that they need to be reactive. And in those situations, they're communicating with first responders. Uh, they're res um, responding to emergency situations. They're taking abuse reports. Um, they're not out there arresting children. I think that that's something that we hear sometimes in our community. But that is not, they are as far from wanting to do that as you could possibly get. So in addition to the uh, SRO that is present at Kent Lake, we also have at Kent Lake and um, Kentwood our marvelous Kent School District uh, school safety officers. So you can see those school safety officers pictured on this slide. Um, truly, just as, as Heidi was mentioning, um, that you know, Jana is working so hard to proactively work with our students and you know, many students develop relationships with her. Um, for example, our school safety officers also are incredibly well known by our students. Um, in fact, uh, it, Shannon Lands, who is pictured on the left, um, there is a little bit of, I would, I would say he is a Kentwood rock star. Um, many, many students know him when he comes in front of them, like if we're doing an assembly, for example, pre-COVID, um, he, they are cheering and clapping. Um, and so he has some really special relationships with students. So all of these school safety officers um, who are pictured here 
um, are working so hard every day to help um, keep our community safe and, and work with staff, students, and of course, parents um, and the community in all that they do. So truly, um, we're fortunate to be working with such um, amazing individuals in, in Kent School Safety. There's lots of other proactive resources that we make sure that we are accessing. It can be everything from mental health resources to small social emotional support groups run by our counselors. Um, we do screeners and we take data and give create opportunities for students to share with us that they need assistance and support. We have tier three, our more intensive supports that we partner with outside organizations for RAP services, reconnect, reroute, uh, at-risk youth petitions. Um, we're also working hard to become trauma-informed resilient schools, especially as we've come back from the pandemic. We know that our students are struggling with this return to school, um, as well as the isolation that they experience. And so what are our trauma informed practices so that we can care for the students because our, if we don't care for the students on that level there's learning is not going to happen. So safety drills uh, each building um, Kent Lake and Kentwood indeed all of the Kent school district schools are doing monthly safety drills so several of them are listed here uh, in terms of uh, preparedness for. Um, an intruder situation or an active shooter situation, that one is referred to um, as a lockdown. You may have heard of those, but then we also have fire drills and earthquake drills um, and tabletops where we run different scenarios, um, practice with the mapping software that we have and uh, the monthly preparation as a leadership team is really essential. Um, and also working with the staff each month and the students each month to get ready for any situation we might be faced with. So let's talk a little bit about run, hide, fight. We work with our students to talk about, and let's be specific and call it out, on an active shooter, shooter type situation, what appropriate responses are. Sometimes it's to run, get out of that area. When I tell my kids to run, I'm like, just don't run to the top of the stairs. You run out of the schools. You run, you go flood Druids Glen with students and get out of here. That's an appropriate response. Sometimes it is to hide. This is the lockdown portion. It's, it's in a classroom. It's um, behind a locked door where you can be safe. And sometimes it's to fight. And we, um, we're honest with them. If you have to be in that situation, then you do it. Look around the classroom, see what there is that you can help protect yourself. I wanna go back to the original quote that we talked about how our purpose here is to empower our students. Mm -hmm. If they know that these are ways to respond, then they're much more comfortable knowing that what their options are. So when we practice uh, lockdowns or when we actually call for a lockdown, um, and Kentwood has had um, two of these this year, not in response to active shooter situations, however, in response to um, high level situations that we needed to you know, basically lock down the school and respond immediately. Um, what we are asking folks to do in the you know, lockdown itself is to lock the door um, cover all the windows, again, create barriers uh, between yourself and the door, um, to be very, very quiet. Um, and this is the, the uh, portion that a lot of students, in fact, I think all students and even staff do struggle with the idea of turning your cell phones off um, so that those are not possibly um, going to be making noises to attract attention. So um, we have lots of people who will immediately go to and start um, communicating with their cell phones. And so we ask them to avoid doing that and also to um, silence their cell phones. Also, we do not specifically want the fire, fire alarms pulled unless you're actually smelling smoke or seeing a fire. And of course, um, what also can be challenging is the thought that once the door is shut, the door is shut. Um, so that can be very, very difficult um, for staff and students to kind of wrap their head around why that might be. Um, and the fact that that person pounding on the door, um, in fact, could be the person who is trying to do harm. 
And so, you know, again, there are multiple aspects of a response and um, that once that door is shut and we're locked down, we are locked down. In front of you right now is an actual picture of my Kent Lake kiddos. We, and when we do our lockdown, our school resource officer has trained our students to flip their tables to create barriers. And it's amazing how quickly a school of 1500 can flip their tables, place their backpacks in a place that keeps them safe to create multiple bar barriers between them and someone who might want to do harm. I think the last time was like a minute 30 that they had everything set up and it was just silent. We turn it into a bit of a contest. In any oh, I, oh, go ahead, Heidi. Okay. In any emergency situation, communication is key. And there's communication happening on all kinds of different levels. There's communication within the school regarding the emergency situation um, using our school-based radios. Um, of course, our school safety officers are communicating with their radio systems with the district. They might be turning around buses so that they're not coming to the school or they might be communicating with law enforcement officers. Uh, our school resource officer is communicating with first responders. Now those could be emergency um, personnel or could be her fellow police officers. And we do have camera systems in our school that um, we can monitor as well to identify where things are locked down, where people might still be out so that we can see um, common areas. There's district communication happening as well. Um, we have a, a central hub at our district office with uh, cameras and radio systems that help also facilitate this uh, communication and fill any communication blanks that we're not able to handle at the school level. We've also um, worked with our, our parents and uh, our families to understand um, what we really do need um, them to do and what we do not need them to do. So uh, definitely one of the most important things is to keep their, their uh, information, their contact information updated. Um, that is so critical. So like, for example, um, we are able to, in the midst of uh, the, the lockdown. So for example, when we had our most recent lockdown, uh, we were able to, from our um, command center, basically be communicating out to our community, community about what was going on in a very brief um, high level way. So for example, um, one of the first messages was, you know, Kentwood High School is in a lockdown, please, you know, please do not uh, contact the school, we will be back in touch with information as soon as possible. So having contact information is, is really super important uh, and that needs to be updated frequently. Um, so what we don't want uh, families to do is either call the school or come to the school. Um, that can actually interfere with the emergency response um, and our response and also can create uh, communication issues. Now, any, anytime you have a lockdown or emergency situation, there's um, always opportunities for us to receive feedback. And there are two things that we hear commonly. One is that we've had poor communication during uh, the incident. And the second thing is that we, you haven't told us enough about what has happened. This is pretty common. So we want to be really clear this evening about the communication piece. Our number one priority is to, to ensure that each and every student is safe. And it's not until then that I will take the time to communicate out to our community. I've got to take care of the, of the students first. And as soon as it's safe, then you're going to start to hear from me. Um, so, that, so in our schools, parents will get a text message that we are in lockdown. Then they might get one that we're still in lockdown. Then they're going to get one that maybe we've lifted the lockdown and that there's an email coming. And then we'll provide as many details as we can in the email that follows up. Now, we have rules that we have to follow in terms of what we can share. First of all, we do not want to impede in a police investigation. And we also want to make sure that we are following FERPA requirements and not breaking privacy rules. The other piece that I, um, we continue to struggle with as a school is oftentimes our community takes what's posted on social media as fact. Mm -hmm. And I assure you that 99.999% of the time, what's on the social media is not correct. What we're sending out to you is what we can tell you and it is fact-based. So 
So in the next several slides, which we're not going to really um, dwell upon because of uh, the time um, that we have this evening, we wanted to try to paint a picture of either the training that is already in place and provided to staff or the training that is being um, planned to be provided to staff. Um, one of the things that I most appreciate um, in terms of working within the Kent School District and, and being a principal is being able to partner with other awesome principals. So um, Heidi and I will frequently share ideas and problem solve um, problems of practice. And this is actually one area where, you know, Kent Lake has done amazing work in this area and Kent Wood, um, as a newer principal, I am still building some of these systems into the school. So there are several slides that have some examples um, and some further um, detailed information on some of the things that are listed here. But these are uh, the types of trainings that we are either already providing or planning towards providing. Kent Lake on a regular basis runs a, a training for our staff on some for our critical incident response groups. We have teams, we have an, a, a medical team, we have a search and rescue team, we have a communications team, and we get the chance to practice. Again, knowing that when we do these things, it empowers people. So this is, these are some pictures from this year where we did control the bleed with some wound packing and chest seals, CPR, clotting bandages, triaging, and, and placing individuals in the rest position. This is some advanced first aid training. So that if we have an emergency, we have a whole contingency of, of staff that are prayer, prepared to provide advanced first aid. So this is an example of a training that is already provided at Kent Lake, and we are working towards providing at Kent Wood. So there was very, some very uh, specific search and rescue training that was provided. Um, we are asked to have an incident response plan um, that has basically four search and rescue teams pre-identified. And so uh, Ken Lake, again, has already provided some detailed training here, and I am working towards providing that for our staff as well. I think it needs to go to be said that we can't do this without partnerships. And so TAC 30, which is the SWAT team for King County Sheriff's Office, does the control the bleed and um, Mountain Fire and Rescue comes and helps us with our search and rescue training. And they've been amazing partners. The other piece that I would say is, uh, especially after what's happened recently with school shootings, is we get a lot of questions about you know, how do you know if someone is, is at risk and what do you do? We do have a safety assessment or threat assessment protocol that we use with students who are identifying those four to five behaviors that we've been talking about or have been involved in a significant issue. Um, a variety of members are involved in that team where we go through a series of questions to really understand the potential uh, state of mind of the individual, the motivation, the, rel the relationships, or identify some precipitating events. And then we put proactive plans in place to support the students so they can be healthy and safe at school. So also, um, you can see that here is the uh, shameless plug. Um, and really, we are looking to always update our emergency supplies and our response backpacks. In, in the case of Kent Lake, their response backpacks. In the case of uh, Kent Wood, they're both bags and also buckets. So Heidi, I don't know if you want to um, specifically speak to that. Yeah, we put together kits for each of our response teams. So you have in front of you the backpacks for our search and rescue team that are supplied with certain items. So our seven teams, if they're deployed, can go through and unjam doors and get kids out of the building that is unsafe. Um, and then we have another medical backpack that we're trying to, to um, make sure that we have all of the advanced type first aid materials in there, which, which are pricey, so that our, our staff can employ those in the case of an emergency. So again, coming back to one of our central ideas, um, one being uh, preparation and training leading to empowerment, and the other, of course, being the entire community um, taking responsibility for one another. And really, if you hear something, um, please say something uh, before, during, and after um, an incident so we can work towards the health and well-being of all of us. 
hopefully we left a, a bit of time for any questions that you might have. Heidi and Samantha, thank you both very much for coming tonight. We were, that was a lot of great information. Um, any council have any questions? Sean? You're on mute still, Sean. There you go. Uh, I just had my microphone up. Uh, thank you, principals, uh, Ketover and, and Mauer. I really do appreciate it. Uh, thank you for taking the opportunity to come and present before the council. I know um, you're both busy, uh, but uh, I think the more we get the word out about this need and, and what the schools are doing, uh, like you said, the more empowered people will feel. So uh, I got a couple of statements and then a couple of questions. Um, you mentioned what the city can do or what um, the shameless plug is. Could you send us the list of those materials? Um, if nothing else, we can we can put it on our SharePoint site, but we can also talk amongst ourselves about how we might be able to, to support the schools with that. Um, are there, um, I guess a couple of things, if I was a high school student now, um, and it, it, it's probably no different than, than when I was a kid, going to someone in authority and, and telling them about something I've seen, one, I want to I'm not sure I really saw what I saw or, you know, heard what I heard. Uh, and two, I want to be sure it doesn't get back to me. So what are the systems that you have in place to, I guess, overcome both of those hurdles? Um, and then I had one other question after that. You want me to go, Sam, or you want to start? Well, I, I think what I would say is from my perspective, it's, it begins and ends with relationships. Mm -hmm. So that is what I would immediately speak to. Um, one of the most important things we can do is to work to establish really positive, healthy, and as deep as possible relationships um, with students and with families. Um, because the more we have those healthy relationships, the more people are feeling comfortable coming forward about something. Um, also, one of the things I know that, that we frequently uh, will do is if we are hearing something and someone has come forward and you know they might in that moment go, I'm not sure if it, we always positively reinforce the coming forward and saying something. You know, it's better to say something and have it turn out to be nothing than to not say anything at all. Um, also, there are some really clear guidelines about what can and cannot be shared as we're as we are following through with an investigation. And uh, many times students staff, even families are going to be reassured by um, the measures that we take to prevent um, any sort of inappropriate information sharing or retaliation. I don't know, Heidi, if you wanted to elaborate on that. No, I, I agree 100% in terms of the importance of relationships. And we make sure that our students at the beginning of the year, we share with them when and where and how to report information. Mm -hmm. We talk about the importance of confidentiality. We talk about trust and we make sure that they know they can tell any adult. It doesn't have to be an administrator or a principal. It can be um, someone in the lunch line. It could be one of our admin assistants. It could be our custodian. We're all part of the Falcon family. You just tell one of us and we'll make sure that it's addressed. Uh, great. And then, um, actually, I thought of another question. Um, but I'll, so for the students, I understand that there's a, an avenue for them to, to communicate as well. Uh, often, I think what happens is students come back and talk to their parents, and then their parents say, uh, I think I might want to call someone. So is there, do they just call the administration? Is that what you would recommend or email? Yeah. They'll okay. call or email. Okay. okay. All they have to do is pick up and call the main line, tell an admin assistant, and it, it, if they can't get a hold of us, I mean, we're, we're on it. We take calls okay. like that all the time. And then finally, I, watching... So when you have your non-planned lockdowns, and I saw the kind of the, the uh, picture there, the students barricaded behind their um, uh, desks and their backpacks in front of their faces. When, when we were kids and in school, we had you know fire drills. And when that was over, even the unplanned ones, you just went back and you went back to class. It, it'd be hard for me to go back to class after an unplanned lockdown. Is there recharge time? I mean, what do you... To just say, hey, turn it off and go right back into class that I'm just wondering what the new normal is for 
going, hey, we just went through something that potentially could have been really bad. So anyway. Sam, wanted... you, you handled this really well this last time. Uh, so the most recent uh, unplanned lockdown that we had, uh, I was concerned because it actually, there, there had been a lockdown previous to this one, um, not in my estimation, not too long, you know, prior or not too far from that ahead of, sorry, it is late and I have been here since very early, <laughs> um, but we'd had two lockdowns, unplanned lockdowns that were relatively close to, to each other in time. And so particularly with that second lockdown, I was really concerned about what was going to be, you know, happening in terms of meeting to support uh, staff and students and the community. So uh, immediately after the lockdown, um, we actually transitioned to the next class period. Um, it was not our planned lunchtime, but uh, one third of our school had not had access to lunch. So the first thing that we did was we dismissed by different regions of the building to make sure everybody was fed. We wanted to make sure that just basic needs were being met. So that was something that we took a look at. Um, also, uh, we arranged for staff to staff check-ins to make sure that we were identifying if there were any immediate concerns that we needed to follow up with. And then we also did a student uh, welfare check-in. We asked students to uh, log into their computers and to complete a quick survey. Uh, one just had to do with trying to get a sense of you know, what range of emotions were we seeing from students? Um, and, and then also, you know, are, is there anything that we should know? Do you need to speak to anyone? Um, on our most recent lockdown day, that check-in survey, I believe that we spoke to, I wanna say our counselor spoke to about 20 students that afternoon um, before dismissal. And then the next day they spoke to, I think another about 14 or 15 students just following up and providing support. Um, and then also in terms of following up with the community, um, a, lot of, a lot of the um, information that folks want is not available, um, certainly immediately. And uh, so lots of times we'll need to manage that actually to support the community um, moving forward. Um, and then of course, sharing everything that we possibly can about the situation so, and addressing any questions. The only, Thank thing, you. the only thing I would add to that is visibility is key. So after one of those events, we make sure all staff mm. are out present. Um, I kind of feel like the mom to 1500 kids sometimes. If I could just <laughs> yeah. be out in the comments, high five and checking kids, ask them if they're okay. If they see me calm, they're going to be calm. Thank you. We'll take one more question, Jennifer. Yes, hi. First of all, go Falcons. Um, second of all, um, I'm sorry, my girl. It's um, great to be alive. Go, it's great go, to be a cop. Yeah. Come on, yeah, go Kent, go you Kent missed Wood. your chance. Kent, I'm sorry. Kent, <laughs> I do have an actual question. Um, so I know you know a lot of the focus here is on active shooters, which makes sense, but when I think of school safety and having a graduate and another one in and a couple more coming in, um, I think of school safety as, as mental health as well. Um, maybe, well, in my particular situation, more so because it is so prevalent and such an important um, issue for our kids. I'm curious, when you say counselor um, that support your schools, are you talking guidance counselors and how many are there compared to how many students? What is a student's path to seek help? And what does that look like for the average student? So we have here at Kent Lake for 1500 students, we have four counselors, they're guidance, our guidance counselors. They do have training in um, identifying um, suicide uh, and suicidal ideations and we have a screener that they're they're connected to um, and they're very good at handling tier one and tier two lower level stuff they're very much aware of when they need to connect with outside students and families with outside resources and they become the conduit between outside resources and and the student and the family we have outside resources that come into our buildings on a daily basis we have Sound Health, we have Valley Cities, we have Kent Youth and Family Services. And so 
on any given day, I have it most likely have some sort of trained individual that we could heck hook up to immediately. If, um, there are also situations though, when if there's an immediate mental health needs, I mean, we've had situations where we've had to do involuntary commitments of students and we are trained in connecting with that resource, working with first responders to get students that immediate high level help as well. Um, contacting the crisis teams uh, connected with the King County Sheriff's Office and things like that. So, so those pieces are, are in place. Okay, so an average student walks in and, you know, talks to their guidance counselor who has training, but they're also essentially the person responsible for registering them in classes and whatever too. I'm just thinking caseload and how much attention are our kids actually getting? If you see well, yeah, I'm always going to be an advocate for caseload. If you look at what the recommended caseload is from the ASCA counselor model, we're not even close to that. We absolutely, in my opinion, should have more counselors on campus. With that said, I don't want to downplay the training that they have to have someone walk in. Yes, they're guidance counselors, but they do have training in supporting students with mental health issues. Um, in terms of developing coping strategies for some of the things that they might struggle with. And they actually run small groups. They might run a small group, um, a therapeutic group on, on stress management and managing anxiety and grief and some of those other pieces. So they do have training in, in those skill sets. And a, a student it can miss class to go to these small groups. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and we, sorry, go ahead. Uh, we rotate them through different class periods so they don't miss the same class period every time. Um, it's really amazing how, how they can build a small community because not only are they learning coping strategies, but they're also learning to support each other, um, uh, cope with whatever they might be navigating. And then a final question related to this, as far as, you know, as some of these students have, have come of age and, you know, are these things that, that students can work with staff comp in a confidential uh, scenario or, you know, are families reached out to or does it depend on the situation? So it depends on, uh, I can start, it depends a lot about the situation. I mean, there are very clear guidelines about what can and cannot be um, kept confidential when mandatory reporting um, becomes an issue. Uh, and also, you know, our counselors are regular resources to each other in terms of navigating those situations. And then also the counselor administrator um, partnership really helps to navigate those situations as well. I don't know if you wanna uh, add anything, Heidi. No, I would just say, if we have a situation where a student is a danger to themselves or others, then the, the type of confidentiality changes. What I would add yeah. is that at the secondary level, um, starting specifically at the age of 13, these, these kids, these young adults really have the opportunity to do a lot of things and they don't need parental permission to do. And we're not um, required or uh, to, nor able to necessarily tell a parent that something's going on. So for example, they can access outside mental health services and they don't need our permission to do that. They can sign up for that themselves. And and I know that that as a as a mom of five myself, I can I I recognize the fact that hey, you're you're only 14 years old and I'm still paying for you, kid. But under the law, they still have the right to make those decisions. All right, thank you so much, Heidi and Samantha. Thank you both so much for um, working late tonight and giving us this presentation. Um, we appreciate all that you do and um, helping guide all of our young adults through uh, Covington, through both your schools, it's very much appreciated. And you opened my eyes tonight with a lot of the information you shared. So I really appreciate that. I thank, hope you, you, thank you. You bet, thank you. And I both, I hope that you both have a very good evening. You as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is our first of two public comment periods. Speakers will state their name, address, and organization. Comments are directed to the city council, not the audience or staff. And comments are not intended for conversation or debate and are limited to no more than four minutes per speaker. Is there anybody in the audience wishing to address council tonight? I see Jonathan. Welcome, Jonathan. Good evening, everyone. I don't know if you can see me or not. 
Nope. I think my camera is working for some odd reason. Uh, first, I want to wish you all a happy new year. Um, it's nice to see everybody. Made it back from the holidays and survived the blizzard. Uh, second, I wanted to uh, mention earlier in your pre-meeting, you were having some discussion about uh, unfortunately timed patching. And I, I don't know much about the Zoom patching, but if your PC is patching itself, unfortunately, and today is Patch Tuesday, um, you can set your network connection to metered and Windows will not automatically update your computer until you, you get to choose at that point. Uh, so you want to, I'm sure Mason can talk you through that. Uh, uh, to continue the uh, little bit about uh, emergency preparedness that we just heard from the schools, uh, Puget Sound Fire and Police to Say is now offering in-person first aid and CPR training again for any of you whose certificates might have expired in the past year, like mine. Uh, I'm signed up for a course in March. Uh, also, the Red Cross announced today that they're having a blood shortage. So if you regularly donate blood, you may want to consider that. And uh, finally, I want to announce that we're doing our first pet food drive for the year for Covington Storehouse this Saturday. Our intent is to keep pets with their families. Many of these storehouse customers have pets. If we keep those pets with their families, they'll stay out of shelters. So I hope to see all of you at Covington Safeway this Saturday. Thanks for your time. And just to make put a smile on your face, uh, I will say that uh, NPR is reporting today that uh, Israeli scientists have successfully taught goldfish how to drive. Have a great night. Thank you, Jonathan. I appreciate that. I will try and see you on Saturday. Is there anybody else in the audience wishing to address the council tonight? Please raise your hand. Uh, seeing nobody raise their hand, we will have a second opportunity for public comment towards the end of our council meeting. Next is approval of the consent agenda consisting of items C1 through C8. Do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. It's been moved by Joe and seconded by Jennifer, I believe. We'll call for a roll call vote. Jared, how do you vote? Aye. Sean, how do you vote? Aye. Christina, how do you vote? Aye. Jennifer, how do you vote? Aye. Joe, how do you vote? Aye. Beth, how do you vote? Aye. I vote aye. It is unanimous to approve the consent agenda. New, moving into new business, item number one is to appoint members of the council's audit committee. Um, currently, we have Jared, Joe, and myself on the committee. Um, I will ask if all three would like to be reappointed, or if not, we can open it up. I'd like to stay on. Me too. And I am happy to stay on there. Um, I just want to remind that the audit committee uh, reviews the bills every two weeks and sign, goes and signs after the council approves the uh, bill process. So I have a motion to approve um, Joe, Jared, and myself to the council's audit committee. So moved. Second. It's been moved by, I believe, Jennifer and seconded by Beth to appoint Jared, Joe, and myself to the council's audit committee. Call for a roll call vote. Jared, how do you vote? Aye. Sean, how do you vote? Aye. Christina, how do you vote? Aye. Jennifer, how do you vote? Aye. Joe, how do you vote? Aye. And Beth, how do you vote? Aye. I also vote aye. It is unanimous to appoint Joe, Jared, and myself to the council's audit committee. Casey, did you want to say something? I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to mention that um, I'm working with Mason to try to maybe make it a little easier on you folks that come in to review where we may be scanning the whole accounts payable packet and uploading it to a, a OneDrive where you can just log on and review everything electronically if you're not able to make it in. So we're working on that and I'll, I'll keep you posted it as to when it's available. Thank you, Casey. Thanks. I enjoy coming in that way I get a chance <laughs> to meet people. And we enjoy seeing you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's move to new business. Item number two is to consider an a appointment to Parks and Recreation Commission. Does council wish to take action tonight? I Joe. Would like oh, Jennifer. I'll let Jennifer go. I'll let Jennifer go. 
Sorry, I was pausing to give someone else a chance. Sorry. Um, I would like to move to appoint Laura Morrissey to fill position number five on the Parks and Rec Commission with the term expiring January 31st, 2025. Second. Okay, it's been moved by Jennifer and seconded by Joe to appoint Laura Morrissey to fill position number five on the Parks and Recreation Commission with a term expiring January 31st, 2025. Jennifer, would you like to speak to your motion? I would. So when I think of parks, I really think of Laura Morrissey. And when I think of uh, City of Covington Ambassador, I think of Laura. Um, I worked with her um, a little bit when I was on pre-pack. And I always appreciate her detailed reports, her passion for um, the offerings uh, provided by Parks and Rec. Um, I think of her when I walk on that little trail behind CCP, you know, the interpretive signs um, she wrote. So um, she has done an exceptional job leading the commission. I'm thrilled with the work plan and the personal goals um, that she has uh, recently been working on. And I think she'll continue to be an amazing addition to that team. Thank you, Jennifer. Joe, would you like to speak to your second? Uh, yes, I, I want to say that I think Laura is the best unpaid parks employee we have when it comes to the city. Um, if, if Honestly, if Ethan doesn't know it, Laura might, um, but maybe not. But Laura is excited about our parks. She wants to make them better. She has a young family. She wants them to grow up in parks. I have a young family. I want them growing up in parks. It, it, we have some of those same interests, and I think Laura is one of the greatest ambassadors for our parks programs that we could ever ask for. Thank you, Joe. Is there anybody else wishing to speak for or against the motion? Seeing nobody raise their hand, it's been moved and seconded to appoint Laura Morrissey to fill position number five on the Parks and Recreation Commission with a term expiring January 31st, 2025. Call for a roll call vote. Jared, how do you vote? Aye. Sean, how do you vote? Aye. Christina, how do you vote? Aye. Jennifer, how do you vote? Aye. Joe, how do you vote? Aye. Beth, how do you vote? Aye. I also vote aye. It's unanimous to appoint Laura Morrissey. Congratulations, Laura. Mm -hmm. Next is new business item number three, to consider appointment to the Covington Economic Development Council. Does council wish to take action tonight? Mr. Mayor? Yes, John. I'll uh, nominate uh, Darman uh, Katra to, oh, I didn't see what position it was, sorry. A replacement position on Economic Development Council with a term expiring July 31st, 2023. Yes, so moved. Seconded. Okay, it's been moved by Sean and seconded by Beth to appoint um, Darman to fill position to fill a partial term replacement position on the Covington Economic Development Council with a term expiring July 31st, 2023. Sean, would you like to speak to your motion? Sure. Um, I really appreciated the, the interview tonight with um, uh, Dahman. Um, you know, she recently moved to Covington, but is uh, committed to taking an active role in uh, seeing her community um, improve not only for the residents but for um, the businesses as well. Um, she's, uh, like I said, excited about uh, being here in Covington. She mentioned that she's uh, been speaking with her neighbors already about um, aspects of the community, including our uh, heard good things about our schools and our parks. So um, I appreciate that. Um, she uh, has a skill set I think will be helpful, brings kind of a different um, a view to um, these commissions, uh, has done outreach work in the past, um, budget work, that sort of thing. So uh, I think she'll make a, a good addition to the uh, Economic Development Council. So thank you. And Beth, would you like to speak to your second? Uh, yes, just quickly. I think a few of the, the comments that really stood out to me is that she has both the people um, side and the analytical side as she's looking at, at uh, scenarios. She mentioned that customers will be their actual residents and trying to, to better um, their 
choices and opportunities as well as helping businesses and also getting to know uh, and understand what we as a city or as an economic development council can do to benefit not just a few people but everybody and i like that broad that broad um lens um and setting the best example she said being an advocate and an amb ambassador 24 7 not just uh, when they're sitting at the in their meetings so thank you beth does anybody else wish to speak for or against the motion seeing no one it has been moved and seconded to appoint daman katra to fill a partial term replacement position on the Covington Economic Development Council with a term expiring July 31st, 2023. Call for roll call vote. Jared, how do you vote? Aye. Sean, how do you vote? Aye. Christine, how do you vote? Aye. Jennifer, how do you vote? Aye. Joe, how do you vote? Aye. Beth, how do you vote? Aye. I also vote aye. It is unanimous to appoint Daman. Congratulations, Daman. Next up is new business item number four to receive public testimony and consider resolutions to support or oppose proposition number one for the Kent School District number 415 replacement of expiring educational programs and operations levy. And with us tonight, Mike Heinisch, um, who is overseeing the Kent School District educational programs and operating levy renewal. I shouldn't say overseeing, but he is pushing for the renewal, I believe, Mike. Mike, welcome uh, tonight. Thank you for uh, sticking around. Um, and I really appreciate it. It's great to uh, see you and hear from you tonight. And I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Mayor. I'm trying to get my camera to work. There it goes. Thank you, Mayor and, and Council members. Uh, like your previous presenters tonight, I'll congratulate you on your re-elections and your reconstitution of the, of the Council in Covington for the year and certainly the best to all the work you do in Covington during the course of this year and the years to come. So my name is Mike Heinisch. Um, some of you may recall I was the executive director of Kent Youth and Family Services for 21 years, uh, retiring the end of 2021. Um, and I was asked most recently by um, the school, by, by Israel Villa, the interim superintendent, if I would co-chair the campaign to um, work on passing this levy. So my presentation tonight is, is to give you some high points on the levy um, and to certainly ask that you consider an endorsement of the levy like a lot of your uh, colleague bodies have done across the Kent, Kent School District service area uh, to date. So I think, Krista, you're going to help me a little bit here because I've never done this before, the PowerPoint thing. So if you would, please. So Can everyone see that? Really, okay, uh, we're going to go through this fairly quickly. This is a presentation that, that the school board um, had back in October, as you can see by the date. I will note that the school board did unanimously, without amendment or really any discussion of any kind, place the, the ballot measure on ballot for February 8th, 2022, unanimously, uh, which is not what has happened previously with the school board. Uh, it is unanimous vote and it's unanimous endorsement on the part of, part of the school board back in, back in November. So next slide. I think it speaks for itself that we know our, um, our communities are strong when our schools are strong. And I, I would subscribe to you that uh, of all of your partners that you've heard previously tonight, um, the chamber, uh, your your principals in your high schools, both Heidi and Samantha, um, are important partners, um, as all of your partners are. But the the school district is really long term your most important partner. Um, and when the school district is strong, the schools are strong, our community thrives. Next slide. This is really nuts and bolts of of the replacement levy. It is a two-year replacement levy, um, so it covers the years 2023-24. Um, it, it's anticipated to generate $76.2 million, which is not an increase of the current levy, um, and that's an estimated um, 
tax rate of $1.88 per thousand assessed valuation, also not an increase. Uh, so this is a flat uh, EP and O replacement levy with no increases requested on part of, of the paying, uh, paying taxpayers of uh, the Kent School District community. Next slide. This is what the levy does. And we'll, I've got some, there's some slides to file that will show you this in a little more detail. Class sizes, career readiness, especially STEM careers, school safety, which you've heard so much about tonight, uh, student health services, which you've also heard about tonight, um, athletics, extracurricular, and the performing arts and, fine, and cultural activities of the district. Next slide. Um, you know, we, we all know that the state funding still, even, even in the post McCleary settlement era is not sufficient to support uh, what, the, what the needs of our districts are. Uh, so this levy uh, funds actually 150 education positions across the district. This levy does, not the state, our levy. And of course, research shows that the smaller class size improves learning outcome for kids. Next slide. Um, it supports much of the, a good part of the math, science, and, and tech education um, that the district offers because we know our, our community is an increasingly high, high tech hub. Um, and so those jobs are there. We want our kids, as they get ready for their, their college experience and beyond, we want them prepared with as much as we can give them in the STEM area to take those jobs in our community. Next slide, Christy. Krista. All right, keeping our kids healthy. The question earlier about mental health. Well, of course, um, first responders consist of nurses too, when it gets to emotional and behavioral health, as well as, as physical health. The, the state funds three, count them, three in school nursing positions. Uh, this levy funds 17 additional positions. So out of the 40, Two school buildings in, in the Kent School District, we have enough to cover roughly half, with three quarters of those or more being funded by this, le this levy, those nursing positions. Next slide. Here's the keeping students safe, which again, um, Heidi and Samantha did such a wonderful job explaining the work that they're doing in their, their high schools in, in Covington. Um, but this levy funds a good portion the vast majority of the safety staff, the school safety staff that the Kent School District um, employs. So those um, school officers that you saw that are hired by the Kent School District and Kentwood and Kent Lake tonight, they won't be there if the levy doesn't pass. And I note on your agenda, your very next item is the consideration of a, of a resolution to continue your partnership with the Kent School District around school safety and school partnerships. Next slide. Uh, we all take pleasure in our extracurricular activities that have to do with athletics primarily. We've had some outstanding success, as you know, with uh, athletic programs in the Kent School District, particularly in, in uh, the, the Covington area schools over the years. Um, this levy, again, virtually funds all of the athletic extracurricular activities that the Kent School District, that the Kent School District offer, offers. Um, ASB doesn't raise the money enough, nearly enough, and the state doesn't provide it. This levy does. Next slide. As well, the cultural and arts offerings of the Kent School District. I think many of us every year attend a cultural or performing arts um, event um, at our local schools. Some magnificent performances. And those also will be gone because the state does not fund fine arts and performing arts and culture. This levy does. Next. Again, we all know that the Kent School District has gone through some rough times financially with a lot of concern about stability, particularly three or four or five years ago. Uh, really, the district needs to be commended for the work it's done to stabilize its house. And here you see the slide. Uh, Moody's elevated their, their bond rating to AA3 back in February with the quote that you'll see below which is a pretty um, supportive statement on the part of Moody's of where the district has come and where the district is now. I'll also say the district does have a fund balance um, that 
sufficient for the future. And as we all know, well-run well operations uh, really need to have a fund balance. So we don't want to use the fund balance or see the district use the fund balance to plug its holes. Um, and really we need to see it, see it for the truly rainy days, not like today, but other rainy days. Um, so this levy maintains that fund balance, does not add to it, and certainly uh, can allow the district to, to utilize the needs to, when it needs to, that bond rating. Next slide. I'll try to move a little quicker in case you have questions. These next few slides are bar graphs that show you where the levy rates uh, stack up over the years in Kent. This is the combined rate um, with 2023 proposed on the far right side as you look at the screen. Um, that rate combined uh, is $3.83. The levy itself, the EP and O levy itself is $1.88 of that 383. The rest is the bond that built schools, including in Covington, as well as the, the, uh, the tech levy that raises the, the total of 383, but still has come down over the last years fairly steadily. And as I said earlier, there's no increase in that combined rate of bonds and levies with this EPO proposal. Next, thank you, Krista. Um, this also shows in a different way it shows the portion that's the EP and O levy, which is a dollar eighty-eight cents. Um, the portion that's the tech levy, and the portion that's the capital bond levy, equaling the the three eighty-three. Next, um, this will show you um, the combined rate of other school districts versus the Kent school district on that overall levy and bond um, rates. And as you can see, the Kent School District is just below the average of $3.88 uh, total compared to the districts around us, including the, the um, this one doesn't have, we have one slide that has, I think, Tacoma or Puyallup, but this one doesn't have that. But you can see from 520 in Auburn, not to disparage our neighbors, down to uh, the Renton uh, amount. Next. And then this one shows um, the same figures for just EP and O. Um, and you can see again, Kent is near the bottom. Uh, only, only lower is Federal Way um, at our proposed rate. Actually, this number, the 169, just to be clear, is from 2020. Um, and so the rate now, 21, 22 raised it to 2000 and. Uh, 21 and 22 levy that passed in 2020 you raise it to 188. That's what we're proposing to keep it at. So these figures are a little bit old, but it does show you that we still will come out the, near the bottom uh, with this levy renewal proposal. <laughs> Excuse me. So the, the, the ballot measure is on the ballot February 8th. The ballots will be out next week. Um, the, the Covington Chamber of Commerce has, has endorsed the levy, as has a number of businesses, individuals, organizations. Um, and what, what I request tonight, respectfully of you, is that you consider an endorsement of the EPO levy as it appears on the ballot so that we can add your name as the city of Covington to the endorsement list on the website and, and, and use your, get your support out in the community to get this passed. One more thing I'll say is. I think you all know that levies need 50% plus one. Um, bonds need 60% still. There is no measure anymore that has it be, being a proportion of the last general election. It's a straight 50% of the vote. That said, we want people to vote. And we want them to vote they, 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 where they need to vote. But it is a 50% plus one passage rate. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. I appreciate you uh, bringing this forward to us. Um, does council have any questions for Mike? Beth. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. Hi, uh, Mike. Uh, just a quick question and uh, you know, pardon me for not maybe knowing this, but will that change or lack of change um, rate, is that very clearly stated on the ballot measure and or on your website so that voters can see clearly 
Yes. That it won't it be is. an increase for so them. It's the just website a website says that I have to be, I have to be totally honest. I want to say honest, but I'm totally clear and say, I'm not sure the ballot measure says that or not. Um, I can find out if I'd have to go back to the, to the measure as it was passed by the school board. I'm fairly certain it does. But I can tell you the pro statement that we wrote that's in the voter pamphlet does does say that that it's a no increase. Great, thank you. Thanks for the question. Does council have any other questions for Mike or do they have any support or oppose this ballot measure? I would like to uh, move to pass a resolution to support KSD's uh, prop number one. I would second that. It's been moved by Jennifer and seconded by Beth to pass a resolution supporting the Kent School District number 415 proposition number one. Jennifer, would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, please. Um, while I would love levy funds to, you know, um, pay for fluff, uh, none of these things are their ne their necessities to our educations and as you know, Mike started out with strong schools, definitely equal strong communities. Um, I've been very impressed with the um, management of the budget to these past um, years, having kind of started my political stuff with KSD and serving on committees and um, various things, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I, I can see the changes and um, it, it's important to continue to support our schools always, 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 uh, always. It's just a, a fundamental aspect to a strong community and society. Thanks, Jennifer. Regan? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to see if before you called for a vote, wanted to open it up to the public as we were required per code to allow um, anybody to express um, opposition or support as well uh, for for this from the public. Yes, I was going to do that after I heard from council. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Regan. Beth, would you like to speak to your second? Uh, I'm, I'm very impressed with the fact that this is an ask to continue utilizing these funds for again for the basics i know the ksd had a you know has had some struggles in the past and it sounds like they're doing a great job managing and uh, making the best use of fundage and certainly are you know we need to invest in our children um, and their education so they can grow up to be um, productive and healthy citizens um, for the future so definitely uh and well-rounded with all of the things that this will help uh cover from arts to athletics to mental health to science and, and career building. So, thanks, Beth. Any other council members want to speak for or against the motion? Okay, see nobody raise their hand. I'll open it up to our audience. Anybody in the audience that would like to uh, speak for support or opposition to this uh, council supporting the ballot proposition? Please raise your hand. Anybody in the audience wishing to express support or opposition to the ballot proposition? Seeing nobody raise their hand, I will call for a vote. Um, it's been moved and seconded to pass a resolution supporting the Kent School District number 415, proposition number one. Jared, how do you vote? Aye. Sean, how do you vote? Aye. Christina, how do you vote? Aye. Jennifer, how do you vote? Bob, how do you vote? Or Joe, how do you vote? I didn't know my name changed all of a sudden there, but I vote aye. Thank you, Joe. Beth, how do you vote? Aye. I was combining both Beth and Joe. I don't know how I came up with Bob, so I apologize. And I vote aye, so it's unanimous to pass a resolution supporting the Kent School District number 415, proposition number one. Mike, thank you very much for bringing this forward tonight. And um, I look forward to having the um, Covington City Council listed as a supporter of this proposition. Tomorrow morning. Thanks, Mike. You have a great evening. And Regan, thank you for uh, reminding me. I'm sure you had it anyway, but. <laughs> thank you. 
Uh, next up is new business item number five, consider a resolution expressing support for school safety and continued partnership with the Kent School District. Regan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, we've heard a lot about school safety tonight, and that's a, obviously a wonderful and incredibly important topic. Uh, at our last council meeting, I believe it was our, our first December council meeting, uh, the city council asked staff to prepare a resolution uh, in support of Kent School District hiring a school resource officer for Kentwood High School and also just generally for um, to support or promote student safety. So the resolution before you tonight expresses your continued support of the partnership that you have with the Kent School District, but also to promote, encouraging the, the continued promotion of school safety uh, for our children in schools. Uh, I'd like to thank Mark for all, the, all his help and work that he did on this, and now turn it over to Council for your deliberations. Council, I have any comments or uh, um, motion to approve? Sean, I know that you brought this forward and would you, do you have anything you'd like to add? No, I, other than I really appreciate the, the council taking the time to consider this. And um, uh, as we heard tonight, um, student safety is of paramount concern to both the schools, but also to the communities as well. And if students don't feel safe and, and teachers don't feel safe, then um, learning's not going on. And if learning's not going on, then our schools aren't doing well. And, Ultimately, our communities are doing well. So, um, you know, that, that's where we are. And I, I really appreciate the uh, city taking this seriously and looking for ways to, to support um, uh, the school district and making sure our, our schools are safe. I do want to, at some point, revisit the, the thought of uh, how we can provide additional support, possibly for those um, resources that they're looking for. Um, obviously, perhaps the asking the levy, uh, some of the levy funds to be spent on that. I also noticed that they're going to add um, nurses possibly. Um, it would be interesting to see if they can uh, dedicate some of their time to mental health issues too. So uh, as Jennifer had mentioned, so anyway, um, yeah. Thank you, Sean. Christina. Yes, um, thank you, Sean. I would literally echo every single word that you said. Um, if there's anything else we can do to help assist, um, I would love to get on board and I'd stand behind that um, in every way possible. I just think that as adults, we have learned mechanisms, learned to cope, learned to survive, learned um, so many things that children under the age of 18 are just beginning to understand. And, you know, couple that with puberty and whatever else that may be going on as their nervous system and their brain evolves, um, no child should be afraid ever. And I, I say that strongly. Um, I know in high school, the coping mechanisms with fear is going to look a lot different than what it will look like in middle school and in elementary school, but um, every cell in my body supports uh, safe schools and um, a safety parameter for children to actually feel safe, not just, and, and that takes action. That takes action because a child won't just know that they're safe. They need to feel and they need to see that they're safe. So I will get off my rant, but um, I support this wholeheartedly. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. Joe. So moved. Thank you, Joe. Second. Jared. Yeah, I would, I would just like to add, you know, uh, I think Jennifer and I are, are very similar in the ways that we're thinking about, you know, the, the resolution states, you know, whereas the health and safety of children is one of the highest concerns. I, one of the things I'd really like to see the, the Kent School District do is hire dedicated, licensed mental health professionals to be on campus. Um, not just, you know, guidance counselors, and that's not to take away from the training that they've had or anything, but I think if you had dedicated professionals that are, I mean, this is what they do day in and day out, you know, take to just worry about that side. I think that we could see a lot uh, healthier relationships. Um, but other than that, I, I agree with everything else. I think this is extremely important. I appreciate Sean for bringing this up. Thank you, Jared. 
It's been moved by Joe and seconded by Sean to pass a resolution expressing support for school safety and continued partnership with the Kent School District. Joe, would you like to speak to your motion? Yes. Uh, as a parent with two students in the Kent School District, as uh, a community member, as a former student, safety of the students, safety of the schools is important. How does that safety look? That safety looks like security officers. That safety looks like teachers who know what they're doing. That, that looks like mental health professionals. That looks like school nurses. That looks like a building that's there to be helpful. And we are, as community members, as people who send our students to these schools, we want them to be safe. We want to know that our students are getting great educations. And at the end of the day, if they need help with anything, there's someone there in those buildings that can help them. I think we, we not only need to be working with the school district on school safety, we need to be pestering the legislature about school safety and telling them that the important things are mental health and safety of our students. And part, by partnering with the school district, we're creating louder voices. And I think that's what's important on this topic. Thank you, Joe. Sean, would you like to speak to your second? Uh, I think I already said what I, what I needed to, so thank you. Thanks, Sean. Anybody else wishing to speak for or against the motion? Beth? Uh, thank you, yes. I, I wholeheartedly support this. I think one thing, it it's not the only thing that we need to be looking at doing to help support our, our children and our students, but it's definitely a first step. And meeting meeting children where they are and where they might even feel safer at school than they than they may be outside school grounds but um great first step to uh, continue putting some effort around this and while they're in school but i think as a council and looking at other opportunities to help support them outside of school time as well because it's going to have to be a multi-pronged approach to help to help build these safer communities and and giving students resources both in and outside of school but this is definitely great thank you sean for bringing it up thank you beth is there anybody else wishing to speak for or against the motion all right it's been moved and seconded to pass a resolution expressing support for school safety and continued partnership with kent school district call for a roll call vote jared how do you vote aye sean how do you vote aye Christina, how do you vote? Aye. Jennifer, how do you vote? Aye. Joe, how do you vote? Aye. Beth, how do you vote? Aye. I vote aye. It is unanimous to pass a resolution. Thank you all very much. Let's move to uh, new business item number six, discuss implementation of an ADA transition plan. We have Bob Linskoff and Delaney Cornwell here. Welcome. Mayor and Council, uh, good to see you and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, basically, over the last uh, half year, I hope you've noticed uh, uh, we're gaining some serious momentum in our capital improvement program. And uh, we can attribute a, a lot of that to the work uh, Delaney Cornwall has done. And this evening, I'd like to introduce you to her. Uh, she's from the University of Idaho, and she worked, uh, I think, five and a half years at HDR as an engineer for them, and we hired her in June, and I would just uh, like to give her the opportunity to uh, present to you tonight and for you guys uh, to get to know her, so thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction, Bob. I was hoping that you would set the bar a little bit lower for me, but I can try to work with that. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council members for your time tonight. I have a few bullet points that I want to hit on, um, but I will try to keep it short because of the time. But as Bob said, I'm Delaney Cornwell. I have been with the city now about seven very fun, happy months. Um, and I'm looking forward to get to know you guys all a little bit more as those months continue. But tonight I'm here to talk about the implementation of our ADA trans transition plan. And so the goal of this plan is to really create 
and accessible community. We really are aiming for equal participation of society members that do have disabilities. And it's a lot more difficult for those individuals to get around when there are features within the city that do not reach ADA compliance. And when I say reaching that ADA compliance, a lot of that falls onto curb ramps within the city. There are many curb ramps that are just at too steep of a slope. And those that are in wheelchairs have a difficult time getting up those ramps. And then on the other end of that, there are landing pieces that are at the top and the bottom of those ramps. And those are necessary for wheelchair users for accessing uh, signal push buttons. And then at the bottom for when you're going off of the ramp, when you're entering an area that has motorized traffic. And so you need a, a landing space to not go right into another hill. And so the way that we would go about determining which of these ramps to upgrade first is based on a ramp prioritization process. And within this prioritization list, we have these different tiers. The first tier being areas that are adjacent to schools. The second tier being downtown areas. The third tier being arterial roadways. And then the fourth tier being local neighborhoods. And the way that we determined this tier system is just based on highly utilized areas. Eventually we would love to, and the aim is to hit all of these pieces and to have all of the ramps upgraded to be within compliance for those ADA people. Um, but for the moment we would start at the top of the list and work our way down to that. And the way that we get there is by using some funding for that. The plan would be to utilize $18,000 annually to start at the top of that prioritization list and work down. And I do say annually because we would like this to be a continuous plan. So that would be $18,000 for 2022, $18,000 for 2023, and so on. And that would be working our way down to the list so that we can hit all of these different places. With that $18,000, the plan is really to utilize this to the most effective way possible. So there are a lot of ramps within Covington that do have the correct slopes being met, but they don't have the detectable warning surfaces within this, in the ramp, which is that bright yellow tactile strip at the bottom. And those are very important for those that are visually impaired. Um, not only because of the brightness of that patch, but also because of the tactile piece so that they can know that they're entering a roadway. So if we approach the first year as installing a lot of these tactile warning surfaces, then we're able to hit a lot of these high priority ramps. So the amount of ramps that we could reach each year would vary, but the, the probably average that we would look to is about three to eight ramps each year. Um, but there could potentially be years that we are getting higher than that and potentially years that we are getting a little bit more on the lower end. And so another just general piece with this is that we would intend to come back to this plan every three to five years and do a little bit of a reassessment to make sure that we're hitting everything that we're looking to hit. And we would reach out to advocacy groups that speak on behalf of disabled members um, so we can figure out what's working, what's not working, what's the most valuable, and that way we can just do a proper reassessment of what we have set up in this plan. And then after that's refreshed, then we move forward. Um, we would also like to be using data that is refreshed every 10 years. So that would include survey telling us what the grades of these ramps are. So really just trying to utilize the most up-to-date data and get every ounce of effectiveness that we can from this funding. And that funding would be coming from the Street Fund Professional Services Budget. And those are kind of the main points that I wanted to hit, but I would love to answer any questions that you guys have about that. Does council have any questions? Jennifer. Yes, hi. Um, I was curious, Given the current listing, about how many years, current listing, current budget, about how many years would it take us to get these ramps up to compliance? That's a great question. And I think that one issue I would say with that is that 
as we continue upgrading ramps, there are more ramps that are falling out of compliance as well. Uh, that just kind of happens over time where the concrete settles and even ramps that are built to compliance end up being out of compliance after 15 years or so. So it would be an ongoing project. Um, I could look into how long it would take to get a rough estimate of all the ramps that are on our list hit and get back to you if that would be helpful though. I yeah, I think I'll come up ballpark with, thank you. I, I was just gonna add that this is just a drop in the bucket. And I think we looked at this and it was years and years and years out. And this is kind of getting our foot in the door and the process started. And in future years, we'll probably come back uh, to you guys ask for more money. Okay, sounds good, Bob. Thank you, Beth. Uh, yeah, just a little bit along those same lines. Um, with, you know, I know there's often talk about if we had more money, but there's also the ability to like, what would be the maximum capacity of these that we could replace or um, be, come into compliance with per year? What's the capacity of, of work if we were able to find more money to do this? Because I, quite frankly, I'm looking at, this is 10 or 15 years, which to me is not what we're trying to achieve from a mobility standpoint. And that's nothing on um, the team. You all are doing a fantastic job with what you have to work with. I'm just trying to figure out. So are we talking labor and yeah. staff work then? Oh yeah, labor, staff work. Um, how hard is it to get contractors to come in and do the work? I know that there's a lot that's... Um, yeah, we've always been pretty good at uh, leveraging our, our funds and, and hiring consultant, hiring those professional services. Um, so if the funding's there, we can hire engineers to assist in implementing our contracts. Uh, we're also uh, going to be hiring a replacement for Sean uh, probably in the next few months. And we'll probably have them administering this uh, first round of these contracts. So if we're looking at maybe doing three to eight per year now, there might be a capacity to do 40 a year if we had the budget to do that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If we had the budget okay. to pay for CM, uh, it, it's infinite. Okay, great. Right. Thank you very much. Appreciate all y'all are doing to, to move this forward. Thanks, Beth. Don. Thanks, uh, Mayor and Council. I just wanted to add to it. I think Bob kind of touched on it too. Um, a, a lot of that is, um, you know, some of this is the beginning phases of identifying, you know, kind of the low hanging fruit. Um, some of, yeah, asking for more funds. Also, as, as we've done in other cases, looking for other, you know, grants and stuff to help uh, with these types of things as well. So it would be the beginning of that. And, and as Delaney said, you know, it's kind of a moving target a little with uh, settling of concrete. Uh, also, um, you know, you could end up having to, because of slopes, you could end up having to remove gutters. Uh, uh, you could end up taking out parts of sidewalks. So it could get pretty big just to bring a, a ramp into compliance. So you could spend, you could spend, you know, $30,000, you know, in an area, if you had, to, I mean, if you had to do significant things to try to bring it all in compliance, I mean, it could be huge, or, you know, you could only spend a, a few thousand, or even less to fix them. So it, it just kind of uh, varies. And I think as we get more surveys, and we do more, get more data and things along those lines, we can refine and be able to provide even more uh, details. And so what's nice about this is for us to be moving in the right direction, because of this document as, uh, as Delaney uh, indicated in the transition plan itself, it is a living document and it's gonna be growing and moving uh, all the time and changing. So this is just us saying, we recognize that, we want to move towards that. We know this is just a, a baby step, but making you guys aware of that and then everyone else know that this is a priority and something that we want to uh, improve on and, and fix. Great, thank you, Don. Thanks, Don. Sean, you're on mute, sir. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Mayor. I um, appreciate this as, as someone who um, is experiencing uh, a family member with some uh, mobility issues. I've become uh, 
it's interesting how aware you become of uh, where there are barriers now. Um, it's really, really funny. Um, I was totally ignorant and, and unaware of, uh, of them, but now becoming more aware of them, but also more aware of um, what businesses and communities are doing to make things more accessible and how some simple fixes or just uh, re-engineering things can make it so that people can access those things. So I really do appreciate it. Uh, if I miss this in the uh, packet, I apologize. Just curious, how many ramps do we think we have out there? Oh, that is a great question. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know about that. I would have to look into it and get back to you, okay. uh, unless Bob or Don know a, an accurate estimate of that. I, I can't recall. Tens of thousands? Tens I of wouldn't thousands. say that many. Okay. I think it's a thousand. It's over oh, a thousand. thousand. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Jared. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I was just curious being a ADA compliance issue, if there was any like grant opportunities that we could utilize or start applying for, or maybe just look into any grant opportunities that would help us fund, um, fund this a little bit more. Do we, do we know if there's anything like that? That's another good question. And I, I may lean on Bob and Don for that one too, but I, I do think that most of our grant opportunities that we go for uh, include more roadway projects that do involve uh, upgrading to ADA compliance, but this is more of a separate piece where it's standalone curb ramps. So there are quite a few ramps that are highlighted in those maps that are within areas that CIP projects are coming through and those ramps will be upgraded and that will be grant funded. Um, but I think that this would be just considered separate from that. Uh, Bob, Don, I don't know if you guys know about any other. Potential. Yeah, there, the, there's a few in uh, the safety programs like the HZIP funding is what our RFBs are. Uh, you have to justify those a, a little bit more with the accident history uh and the need and then there's state funds like the safe routes to school grant and obviously those are more focused around school areas uh so uh, a lot of our ramps are going to be outside of uh those those high scoring areas uh like these projects and those are the the difficult ones that are going to be for us to uh get grant grant funds for gotcha do we know if we've had any accidents i'm just curious Yes, we even have an accident map. Um, I can send that out to you guys. It's it's pretty weird to see, but yeah, there's highlighted uh, incident areas. Jared, what what kind of accidents are you specifically referring to? Oh, he just referred to like uh, any, as far as like just justifications for the the grant process. If there was any accidents, as far as like pedestrian accidents for ADA issues, you know, if, if there was a, a lack of accessibility that someone that's maybe disabled have just had issues overcoming that. Thanks for the clarification. Beth. Uh, yeah, thank you again. Um, also wondering if there's an opportunity to focus, like we've got what, three now, um, uh, senior living um, complexes within our downtown core and having an opportunity for them to safely get to the grocery store or navigate. I know that we've we've heard some, um, we've had some comments from, from some of the public reaching out to council about some of those areas and if that would also be a, a priority or if there's grant funding for that type of scenario, even it's not necessarily in a school zone, but definitely a, a community or a group of folks that might need some of that additional help for mobility. Yeah, there's actually one right in front of the Department of Licensing right there uh, near Polaris, and, and that one's going to be uh, quite expensive to fix because that's uh, quite a big offset, but we we definitely have our eye on that one. All right, thank you all very much. We have before us council the opportunity to make a motion to authorize the city manager to approve implementation of the ADA transition plan as well as to take steps that do not exceed the spending authority of the city manager 
towards retrofitting curb ramps towards plan completion and full compliance. So moved. Second. By Jared and seconded by Christina. Jared, would you like to speak to your motion? Uh, no, thanks. I just think it's necessary. Thank you, Jared. Christina, would you like to speak to your second? No, not not more than this is absolutely necessary for our city and residents. Is there anybody else? Thank you, Christina. Anybody else wish to speak for or against the motion? Beth? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I will just say it one more time. I think it's great. We need to do it. And we probably need to revisit it and see if there's anything else we can do to augment. The work being done in the future. Thank you, Beth. I'd like to say that I'm in full support of this because as someone who is now using the ramps on a regular basis, um, seeing them get improved is great. And I hope that uh, the private property owners that have shopping centers will also take action and start fixing theirs as well. Don. I just want to clarify one thing just on the, I think, and, and Delaney can correct me if I'm wrong. I think on the accident map, I think we're referring to like pedestrians. I don't know that there's really a ADA um, uh, lack of or um, barrier or something like that that's tied directly to, um, to these accidents. But I could be wrong, but I, th I think it's more of a, a pedestrian related uh, but that's, um, Delaney, I don't know if you. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. So we have two maps. One shows pedestrian or non-motorized accidents, which is bicyclists and pedestrians. And then the other highlights those out of compliance locations. So I think those two in combination could kind of give a better sense of what you're looking for. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Delaney. Been moved and seconded to authorize the city manager to approve implementation of the ADA transition plan, as well as to take steps that do not exceed the spending authority of the city manager towards retrofitting curb ramps towards plan completion and full compliance. Call for a roll call vote. Jared, how do you vote? Aye. Sean, how do you vote? Aye. Christina, how do you vote? Aye. Jennifer, how do you vote? Aye. Joe, how do you vote? Aye. Beth, how do you vote? Aye. And I vote aye. It is unanimous to authorize the city manager to approve implementation of the ADA transition plan. Thank you all very much. Thank that you. Oh, and, you're and, welcome. Thank and you so thank much you for your support. And thank you for uh, funding our CIP project manager. We uh, couldn't be happier. Bob and Delaney, thank you both very much for presenting tonight. It was great seeing you. And thank you for sticking around so late. Thank you guys as well. Appreciate meeting you all. Uh, next up, um, we have completed all of our new business. So future agenda items, looking at our future agenda for January 25th. Um, we have several items on there. Does council have anything they'd like to see on a future agenda item? Okay, we will have our council summit at the end of this month as well, and that will be virtual. We'll start with going to council staff comments. Start with Megan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't have anything tonight. Thank you, Megan. Ethan. Good evening, council and mayor. Um, just one item. We have a survey that opens tomorrow. This is for uh, SoCo Park in the, the master planning process that we've started. Uh, it's going to run for two weeks, and this will be the first opportunity for the public to provide input on what they would like to see at SoCo Park. Uh, and then results from this survey will inform uh, what that master plan will be, and that will be shared at a future open house and with the Parks Commission and eventually come to the council for a presentation and consideration for adoption. So um, just sharing this because we're going to have a survey going out to the public for the next two weeks. And we'll, of course, promote that through our regular channels, but always encourage people to share it with their friends and neighbors so we get as much uh, information from the public as we can. And that is it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Ethan. Don. Uh, nothing tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Selena. Hi, good evening, Council. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay, great, thanks. Um, I just wanted to let you know that uh, we have four positions in the community development department that we're gonna be filling over the coming months, hopefully. And so we just put out our first um, job posting for a development review engineer. So it's gonna be really exciting changes coming along in the community development department this year, and we'll kind of keep you abreast of those, but um, just wanted to put that out there. If, if uh, you see that on my LinkedIn or something like that, you can pass that on. Um, otherwise, I have nothing else to report tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Selena. Casey. Uh, I just had a couple ARPA updates for you. So um, on January 6th, uh, last week, the Treasury Department released the final rules, finally, uh, for the administration of the ARPA funds. And we're in the process of reviewing all um, 437 pages of it. So we're, we're super excited for that. Um, and then I just wanted to give you a couple updates on some of the programs that we're working on rolling out. Uh, so the utility aid program, um, we've met with the Covington Water District and we're just getting ready to administer a contract with them to start getting some of those um, utility aids out to the past two customers. Um, we met with Sioux Creek Water and Sewer and unfortunately they have declined the funds due to staffing issues. Uh, they don't have the staff to administer the program. We reached out to Vine Maple Place to see if they may be able to help um, administer that program on their behalf. And unfortunately, they are also having staffing issues and are not able to help. So because this is a long-term program and we have these funds through 2024, I'll continue to reach out to Karen at the, the district and see if maybe once they get their staffing on board that they can roll out that program maybe towards the end of the year. So. So we have that, um, the small business program, um, we've just gotten the applications and the contracts updated and we're hoping to start advertising the program at the beginning of February. And then our human services programs, again, we've, uh, we're just in the process of updating those applications and contracts and are hoping to roll that out mid-February. And they'll also be working with the human services commissions to kind of keep them updated on which providers will fund since this is, since this is also a funding cycle year for them. So they'll need to know which, uh, what we're doing with which providers. So I just wanted to give you guys a couple updates on that. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. Regan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, officially, I want to say Happy New Year because I haven't had an opportunity to do that to the whole council yet. Um, new beginnings are wonderful. And uh, I think that's the same for, uh, for New Year's. Uh, I just want to let you know with our summit coming up uh, today, I did send in uh, final edits to our summit agenda to Jim. So he'll finalize those and um, staff's working on the packet material. We'll get that out to you the week of the summit. And then also, of course, uh, congratulations to Joe, Beth and Jennifer uh, and your swearing in. And then, of course, to uh, Mayor Wagner, Mayor Pro Tem Smith for your reappointments. Um, uh, we as, as staff, and i speaking for staff this time, love working for this council. Uh, you make working here uh, really quite an honor and pleasure, and we just deeply appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you, Regan. Mark. Uh, there's no executive session tonight, and I have nothing further. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Krista. I have nothing tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Krista. Jared. Uh, I have nothing other than I think that I totally ordered the same cactus neon light that's hanging on Jennifer's wall <laughs> on Amazon. I just saw that back there and I was like, holy cow, I just bought that. <laughs> other than that, happy New Year's. I'm super excited to see uh, what we accomplish in 2022. Thanks, Jared. Sean. Yeah, I don't have anything. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Sean. Christina. Sneaks up on me every single time. Um, just happy New Year's to everyone. Happy to do another year with this amazing team. I hope we get along just as well as we have for the last two team or two years in this in 22. And let's do this. Thanks, Christina. Jennifer. I'm wondering why um, Jared ordered a cactus light from Amazon. I was gifted this beauty by my children who um, then immediately the next day started wondering when I was gonna hang it up at my desk so everybody could see. So there you go. <laughs> I was bored and I had, a, I had a gift card. I was like, you know what would be cool? A cactus neon sign. <laughs> 
Yeah, the kids love it. Um, uh, I just wanted to say congratulations to Krista in your role as a city clerk. Swearing-ins went beautifully and um, I'm excited um, uh, about your, your new role and know that you know, you'll continue to do great. And um, happy new year, everyone. Thank you, Jennifer. Joe. So uh, I'm gonna start with, I feel a little chipped that I didn't get to be at the ceremony or our swearing in ceremony on Friday. Uh, I was diagnosed with COVID on Friday morning. I will tell you, I'm at about 95%. The only thing still keeping me down is this stinking uh, nasal passages right now. I, I can breathe, I never lost taste, I never lost smell, so sort of okay, I guess. But um, we're doing fine here at home. Just give you all that update. Uh, I wanna congratulate uh, Beth and Jennifer on four more years with you guys. I'm looking forward to serving that with you. Looking forward to seeing all the wonderful things we can do for the city. Uh, that said, I just thank you all for, you know, some of the messages I got, and I thank you. Uh, I'm hopefully we can have one of those official in city hall swearing ins for me, so my family can see that some other time. But other than that, I'm looking forward to this year. Looking forward to what we can do and hope making the city better. Thank you, Joe. Beth. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, congratulations, Krista, on your promotion. Looking forward to even working with even more or in the future, you're doing a great job. So thank you. Um, quick question about the agenda for the 25th. I, we are having a hearing for Lake Point, I believe. It was noticed, I think we got an email about a week or so ago. I didn't see it on the agenda. I just wanted to make sure that was still going on because it wasn't listed. But, um, and yeah, looking forward to 2022 and all the great work we can, we can all accomplish together. Uh, Krista, I think, could answer that there. She's got her. Go ahead, Krista. That agenda item was added after the packet was created. So it is on the future agenda. Thanks, Krista. Thank you, Beth. Uh, I just want to say thank you to each of you, um, council members, for uh, choosing me as your mayor again for another two years. I really appreciate it. And I really enjoy representing this city and each of you um, as council members. And I enjoy representing the residents and our staff everywhere we go. And uh, it's, a, it's a true pleasure being able to do that. And my girls really love representing the city as well when uh, we go, uh, especially like when we do the um, going around the city for our brag tags for Ready, Set, Play. Uh, and congratulations, Krista. Um, the in-person went so smoothly, and I'm glad that you were able to sign all the oath of office. And yes, Joe, we will do it in person so that your family can come show up. So we swore in Jennifer and Beth, and we just swore at you. So um, you weren't there to get it. So sorry. Nothing new. Nothing new. Uh, we didn't say anything about you, Joe. We, we're reserving that till we can see you in person. So thank you very much. I do not have anything else. Um, we'll go into our second uh, public comment period. Uh, speakers will state their name, address, and organization. Comments are directed to the city council, not the audience or staff. And comments are not intended for conversation or debate and are limited to no more than four minutes per speaker. Looking at our audience, if there's anybody in the audience wishing to address council, please raise your hand. Seeing nobody raise their hand, I want, there is no further business. There is no executive session tonight. So thank you all very much for a very great first meeting of 2022. I hope you all have a great evening. Thank you. Good night. Good night.